If you look on the market, proper ventilators, that's that the full function, can start somewhere between $15,000 and above. Hello, welcome to Yen TV with me, Philip Abutiati. Today we are here at Academic City. COVID-19 has dominated the world, the news, every news portal, and there's a strain on ventilators globally. In Ghana, in fact, there are just a little below 200 ventilators, I understand. And here at Academic City, one lecturer, the president of the city, Dr. Fred McBangaluri, is working hard behind the clock to develop locally produced ventilators at low cost. We are here to interact with his team and find out how the project is going and the way forward. Let's get inside and speak to them. So I'm here at the lab with Dr. Lucy Ejapong. She's part of the team that uh, has developed the ventilators, locally manufactured ventilators, and she's, I'm going to have a conversation with her. She'll tell us about the project, how it started, the journey so far, and the way forward. She's the Dean of Engineering, the Dean of Engineering here at Academic City. Hello, Doctor. Hello. Good to have you. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Right. So congratulations. Oh, thank you. I think it's a big achievement. With our prototype, yes. um, we're very excited, but we're also very excited about how we can take this forward and how eventually we can productionize it. At the moment, it's in its, it's in its infant stages, it's very early. Um, however, we are quite happy with the results so far. It looks very promising, but there's still a lot to do. All right, so tell us, how did the whole idea begin? Is it something you've dreamt of or... COVID-19, you know, brought the idea out. So I would say that the COVID-19 episode is what originated this whole idea. So I have to give credit where credit is due. Professor Fred Magbangalori, our president, basically when we all shut down for the university, the university was migrating all his courses online. And he was like, what can we do as a nation? Because we can't just sit on our laurels. Looking all over the world and looking even in the West, who have thousands and thousands of ventilators, there is still a need and they're still having shortages. So he came up with this initiative and he came up with a call. He put a call actually on Facebook to say, innovators, um, engineers out there, who wants to come on board so that we can um, design and manufacture a low cost ventilator for use in countries like ours. We do not necessarily have all the materials, we do not have all the facilities that the West may have, but we still have the brains, we still have the knowledge. So how can we use locally available materials of the shelf solutions to put together a prototype? Right, so um, the team, how many people is it made up of? At the moment, your team is about 10 core team members who are here, but we have a lot of support from all over. So we have the president, we have myself, we have um, um, engineer um, Salom Abo, who you'll be talking to. We have some, um, we have David, um, who is a former HSC student, who's also working on a lot of the design work for us. We have our own academic um, city students. We have them looking at the electronic control systems. They are doing the modeling and simulation. And we also have the likes of Benjamin or who are like our technicians, our manufacturers, who are helping us put everything together. That's what I think. Right. So let's talk about the ventilators. Yes. I'm sure people are wondering why this prototype is a breakthrough and everyone is talking about it. And so before if we even started the interview, I was speaking to one of the team members and I was asking him on the market, on the world market, how much on the average does a ventilator cost and how do you intend to price yours? So if you look on the market, proper ventilators, that's that the full function, can start somewhere between $15,000 and above. Some you may even get it at $10,000, but it's still a significant amount of money. However, we are not the only um, people looking at low cost um, ventilators. All over the world, there has seen a need and a rise for the requirements of low-cost ventilators because we need something that can do the job now, 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 now. So if you look, MIT, Oxford University, they are all coming up with their versions of low-cost ven ventilators. So we wanted to come up with something because we know that we have the locally available materials. We know that we have some things that we can use here that can perform in a similar function. So we are expecting that our ventilators run to range somewhere between um, a thousand Ghana cities or somewhere maximum shouldn't go more than five hundred dollars. Right. Now let's talk about progress so far. How mm -hmm. close are you to let's see commercializing 
the ventilators? So at the moment, we've come up with four concepts that we're working on. We're working on the piston type concept, which my, um, uh, one of my team members, um, Solom, will be taking you through. That one concept has three different ways that we can look at how we can power it. The manual means where he will demonstrate to you when the time comes. Another means which will, um, it will be driven by rack and pinion to automatically drive the piston. We have another concept that I'll be showing you later on, which is the leather below concept. And then the, our last concept as well is if we didn't have um, this particular concept, we could replace it with oxygen canisters to release the, um, the air at the right time for the, um, for the patient. Now I'm sure you're going to be needing a lot of partnership and collaboration. Have you started getting calls? It has been an interesting week, I have to say, because I think we have a lot of people coming who are volunteering, who are, um, um, you know, um, volunteering either something to help support this cause. So I think we expect more to come on as um, we get more awareness. We've had people buying us lunches already, people sending money to say, oh, we're feeding your team today. Um, we've had people come on board, um, companies like um, MES, saying that we will help you support and acquire equipment. We've had people donating masks to the team so that the team are protected whilst we do this and we're looking to see where else we can go with this obviously once we prove our prototype we are looking to engage medical professionals as well because ultimately this will be used in a medical facility and they need to ensure that it meets the strict requirements that they they require in order to use it on a real patient how about from central government have you had any call yet I think we're, we've not had any direct call yet, I believe, um, but I think there's been a lot of interest and there's been a lot of um, appetite coming from all over. So we'll wait and see. All right. Now, if government is supposed to step in, let's say the president is watching or the minister of health and he puts the question to you that how can we help you? What's, what help do you need? What, what would you have to tell them? So I think what we will tell them is that, first of all, we would need um, for to be made um, available to us the process to be able to validate and um, test this concept as quickly as possible. You know, when you're going through some um, regulations to get um, equipment and machinery on the system, sometimes it can be tedious and sometimes it can take a long time. So what we'd want support from government is to be able to um, get the right people to us quickly, not to say that we are going to cut any corners, that's not what we are asking for, but for the process to be streamlined so that we can get this to market quickly. Obviously, if there's going to be any support for be it financially or materials we're not going to say no we're going to welcome anything like that let's come a bit back to uh, you know on a lighter note yes. do you think COVID-19 is more like a blessing in disguise because without that we probably wouldn't get the attention you're having you're, you're getting now you wouldn't have thought of building a ventilator even if you had thought of building a ventilator I think people wouldn't see the need to reach out to you do you think it's a blessing in disguise <laughs> I think that's a tough question to answer, even though I know it's supposed to be a light, a light question that is this a blessing in disguise, because actually Academic City, we are constantly innovating and we are constantly coming up with things. So I think because of the COVID-19, that has drawn attention to us specifically because of this event. I mean, I, I mean our students are already building 132 um, egg incubators, which have already hatched over 60 eggs. Our students have built um, a smart bin, which is able to turn itself around and empty itself. We're constantly innovating and we're constantly coming up with a problem and what we try and do here is that everything we come up with it has to be contextual and relevant to the society we live in so we're constantly looking around and say what can we do to add value to our society so this is just one of those that we think here is another way where we can apply our engineering knowledge together with um, anybody who's willing to join to make something that will benefit our nation all right so now how soon should we expect work to be completed that is a tough question because we are hoping that we will be able to prove the prototype as quickly as possible. We've given us a bit of a tight um, um, deadline by the end of the month to be able to have a fully working concept, test it on a dummy, engage the people that be. Now, how long it will take to productionize or commercialize or have a, a working production and, and producing it, that is a bit tricky because it depends on how much materials you have, where we have to source the materials from, are they available, if we can't find something in Ghana and we have to import, how long is that going to take? So we're still looking into that because ideally we want to see if we can use only locally available materials. But where push comes to shove, those are some of the things that may delay us in getting things done quickly. And it's hard to put a figure, a point to it at the moment. It depends on resources, finances, and all that as well. All right. Okay. So this design you have here is a basic ventilator. 
So let me take you through the disease condition and then why a ventilator is needed and then the principle of operation of this particular one. Okay. So in the disease condition of the heart, as in if someone gets the coronavirus, what happens is that, so there are some tiny, tiny balloons in the heart called alveoli. And in the disease uh, lungs, some of the alveoli are filled with fluids. Some two have collapsed and then some two are okay. That's why the, the patient is able to breathe, but then has shortness in breath. So when that happens, your first thing to do is to inflate the collapse, lung, the collapse of your life, right? And then also to maintain the good ones so that the patients can breathe more easily. So what you need to do is introduce a tidal volume into the lungs and then maintain an end respiratory pressure, a positive end respiratory pressure to keep the collapsed lungs and the okay lungs in a good condition for the patient to be able to uh, carry out uh, uh, breathing. Okay. So in this case, what we are doing is that in the basic ventilator, you need an air source, okay. right? Then from the air source, you need to humidify it. So humidification is basically moistening or wetting the air because you don't want dry air entering into the patient. The feeling you get when dry air enters into, into you is when you are in a very airtight air conditioned room that doesn't have very good ventilation. Immediately you get inside, your nose becomes dry. So that's condition you don't want to do that. So you pass the air through water, then it becomes humidified before you introduce it into the patient. Of course, through a bacterial filter to, to, to filter out any bacteria. So from there, it comes into the patient's lungs. So that is the inhalation cycle of the respiratory system. Then it's now left for the patient to what? Expire, exhale. So when the patient exhales, it goes through a positive end respiratory valve. So this is a pressure that will prevent the patient from expiring all the air in their lungs because you want to maintain the lungs in a positive pressure. You don't want a situation whereby they they expire everything and their lungs collapse again. So this is supposed to prevent the patient from expiring everything in their, in their lungs. And then it goes through the final stage of the scrubber. This scrubber is necessary because COVID-19 can be gotten through expired air, right? So you pass the expired air through 70% of alcohol to kill the virus before the expired air is let into the atmosphere. If you don't have this, what it means is that the health professionals and anybody around will be infested with the COVID-19. So basically that's it. So I'm about to demonstrate how this particular one works and then we'll take it from there. This, this is serving as a pump, right? So it takes air in. When you lift it, what happens is that you create a negative pressure in here. And then when you push it down, because this is a one-way valve, the air goes through this, into the humidifier. Then from the humidifier, it comes directly into the lungs. So when you pump it, it inflates the lungs. You understand? When you pump it, it inflates the lungs. So once the lungs is inflated, and then the patient goes to the expiratory phase, then it goes through the rest of the system and then into the atmosphere. So basically that's how it works. So for now, the reason why I'm still using my hands to pump is that we want to make solutions that are fit for every conditions that we have in our health sector. In some remote villages, they might not have electricity. So if you mechanize this, where are they going to get power? But then a, the relative of a patient can be somewhere far away and be pumping. And then this will be connected to the patient somewhere. And they might take turns in doing this. Then we'll have another version where we are going to connect a rack and pinion system to this and a motor. So when you plug it and you start it, it's going to be what? Automatic. You understand? It's going to be automatic. 
And then the third option is to connect pressurized oxygen tank. So when you have the oxygen cylinder, you connect it to this. Because it is already pressurized, you don't need any motor to drive it. Once you open it, it will drive itself and then feed the lungs. Of course, this will also be coupled with the intelligent system. If I say the intelligent system, you know, breaths are taken in a time manner. So you have to deliver the breath when the patient what, needs it. So we, will, we are building the electronics to also control when the breath should be given, when it should stop for the patient to what, expire. All that will be built into the system. How about mobility and agility? So as you can see, see this, this metal pole yeah. will have, so this is basically for proof of concept. Okay. So the final product will be on casters. So you, you push it around, okay. you understand? So it makes, it makes nurses and everything easier for them to, yes. So it's not going to be like this. So. Um, our second station, this is where all our electronic control system, that will be the main um, system that ties all our various concepts together. When we're looking at the intelligence of our ventilator system, it comes from this, this particular workstation. And I'd like to introduce one of my students, he's an academic city student, second year, who has been working together with another student called Barnabas, and they have been doing all the automated electronic control programming and everything re relevant to that. Nathaniel. Hello. Hi. Nathaniel. Yeah, my name is Nathaniel, and um, I've been working on ensuring that we have um, this thing working um, in an automatic manner for the patients, right? So what we have here is um, a motor connected to a shaft, which is pushing this bellow system up and down. So it's like um, the rotational motion of the motor is being translated into a linear motion, which is pushing it. So um, when you see um, these holes here will be connected to hoses in there and then the air that will be pushed in will be used to supply that. So this is just like a basic pushing mechanism to control any, the, any other setup that will be built in here. So what we have here is, um, you see, this is going to um, convert the electricity from the national grid into um, a much lower voltage that has like um, 15 volts, which is going to power the motor, right? And so what we have here is um, a setup that is going to control the motor based on code that will give to it or any other programming that will give to it so that it will move according to how the patient breathes, right? So very soon we'll incorporate um, pressure sensors into this and then we'll have it moving according to how the pressure in the lungs of the patient. So based on any mode that the doctor would want to set it to, we can also, we would also incorporate that into the design. And so basically that's what we have here now. So the last team that um, is situated around the corner, um, we have two of our Academic City students again working on the modeling and simulation of all the various concepts that we are looking at. So they are simulating the first prototype, the piston type um, configuration. So they will be looking at it and designing it and then putting it into a nice casing for us, as well as simulating the processes. And from that, all the analysis that will determine how much pressure we need, how much force is generated to drive each of the motors, the piston configuration, um, the rack and pinion configuration, they will be simulating that as well. Then they will be moving on to simulating the bellow concept. The bellow concept is the one that uses the wiper motor to drive its mechanism. Again, how it integrates within our output system and goes through the peep valve, then through to the scrubber and then into the atmosphere. Again, they will model that and simulate that. They will also be doing a couple of fluid analysis and mechanical analysis as well.